Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an action, drama, mystery film called Source Code. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. On a commuter train bound to Chicago, a man wakes up, confused at his surroundings. The woman sitting in front of him calls him Sean, thanking him for his advice that gave her the courage to end a terrible relationship. But the man doesn't know her. He claims to be U.S. Army pilot Captain Coulter Stevens, whose last memory was on an Afghanistan mission. The woman laughs, thinking that it's a joke. After the train departs Glenbrook Station, Stephen sees a different man's face from the reflection in the window. He rushes to the bathroom and confirms what he sees in the mirror. Flustered, he faces the woman just as the train passes by another. Their conversation ends with the train exploding, killing the passengers. Visions of the woman in a large mirror-like sculpture in a park flash before his eyes. Stevens wakes up in a dark capsule where another woman's voice informs him that he's in beleaguered castle. He checks his surroundings, confused at the seatbelt strapped to him and the monitors in front of him. One of the monitors switches on, allowing him to see the woman's face. She tells him to remember her name, but he couldn't. The woman changes the question, asking him what he remembers. According to Stevens, he was flying in Afghanistan, then he woke up on the train that exploded. The woman dodges his questions but instead helps him remember through a series of memory exercises. Stevens is successful in the exercises, which trigger his memory, recognizing the woman as Captain Goodwin. From the monitors, Stevens sees another man, Dr. Rutledge, adjust something in Goodwin's computer before leaving. Goodwin instructs him to figure out who bombed the train, advising him to locate the bomb first to identify the bomber. With no time to protest, Stevens is sent back to the train. All the small events from the previous run happen again, but his different reactions result in a different conversation with the woman in front of him. Thinking it's a simulation test, Stevens fawns over the program's unbelievable detail. He confronts a passenger who's concerned about the train's delays, interrogating him. The woman diffuses the situation, recognizing the man as Max Dinoff, a comedian from a television show. When the train stops at Glenbrook Station, Stevens observes what happens inside the train he missed previously. Remembering where the explosion happens, Stevens walks to the back of the train and into another bathroom. He climbs onto the vent and finds the bomb hidden inside. He asks Goodwin how to disarm it, believing that she's watching the program he's in, but when he receives no answers, Stevens decides to leave the bomb. Hoping to prevent anyone from triggering the bomb, he pretends to be transit security and orders the passengers to turn off all electronic devices. An obnoxious passenger refuses to turn his laptop off, earning him a punch from Stevens. The passengers are alarmed by the action, but Stevens believes it's all part of the program. Despite this, the bomb still explodes. Stevens wakes up in the capsule, finding hydraulic fluid dripping inside. Frustrated, Stevens demands to speak to Dr. Rutledge, whom he believes is the commanding officer, but Goodwin denies him. She reveals that he's been with them for two months, despite remembering being in Afghanistan yesterday. Tired of proceeding without information, Stevens refuses to give them the bomb's details without learning more about his mission. Goodwin gets permission from Dr. Rutledge before she relays the information to Stevens. At 7.48 in the morning, the bomb exploded on the commuter train in Chicago. There were no survivors. Sean Fentress, one of the passengers, is who Stevens has been inhabiting in the program. The train explosion is only the first attack, and they hope to capture the bomber before the next. Still confused, Stevens informs her where the bomb is and that it's detonated by a cell phone. There were 52 callers connected to the cell tower nearest the train when it exploded. They deduced that the bomber might have been in an area to see the commuter train pass the freight train, so the explosion engulfs both. Goodwin orders him to learn more about the train's passengers to identify which of them is the bomber. As with all the following simulations, he only has 8 minutes before the train explodes again. Wasting no time, Stevens wakes on the train and sets his watch to count down to 8 minutes. He converses with the train conductor, who hasn't seen anyone suspicious. Then, he invites the woman to observe the passengers with him. Thinking it's a game, the woman makes conspiracy theories about the passengers until Stevens notices a man coming out of the bathroom where the bomb is. The woman points out that he also used the bathroom, prompting Stevens to check Sean's bag in case he's the bomber. From Sean's notebook, he learns the woman's name is Christina. Arriving at Glenbrook Station, Stevens convinces Christina to depart the train with him to follow the other guy. After getting off the train, Stevens leaves Christina outside the station while following his suspect. The man hurries away, coughing until he reaches the bathroom. Stevens pretends to wash his hands to observe the man, suspicious of his actions. Their eyes meet as the man dries his hands, forcing him to hurry away. Stevens follows the man outside and approaches him. The man claims to suffer from motion sickness and threatens to call the police if he doesn't leave him alone. Stevens fights the man, stealing his suitcase as he searches for the detonator. Their fight ends when the train explodes from afar, confirming that the suspect is not the bomber. Stevens, however, is not convinced. He tackles the suspect, who kicks him, making him fall into the tracks. Christina and the man beg him to get off the tracks as a train approaches, hitting him. When Stevens wakes up in the capsule, it's freezing inside, and the monitors don't work. Something powers down, alarming both him and Goodwin. The lights go out, and something metal creaks and groans. In the control room, Goodwin and Dr. Rutledge figure out how to connect back to Stevens. Dr. Rutledge admits that Stevens doesn't have a lot of time left. 
Meanwhile, Stevens undoes his seatbelt and attempts to break the capsule to escape. When it doesn't work, he manually repairs the cooling system, successfully activating the heating vents. Then, Stevens repairs the monitor, allowing him to connect with Dr. Rutledge and Goodwin. Stevens admits that he hasn't found the bomber but claims to have saved Christina. Goodwin, however, says it doesn't matter as the Christina he met is only part of the source code. Dr. Rutledge explains that the source code is a machine that combines the deceased passenger's residual collected memories, which lasts eight minutes before the explosion. Sean Fentress was Stevens' best link, allowing them to connect Stevens' consciousness to Sean's final eight minutes. However, after eight minutes, the source code ejects Stevens. It is not time travel, therefore, he cannot save any passengers in the real world. To prove a point, Goodwin pulls up Christina's information and confirms that she already died on the train that morning, even though Stevens pulled her out of the train in his last simulation. The conversation isn't letting their mission move forward, aggravating Goodwin and Dr. Rutledge. They insist that another attack is coming, therefore, they must identify the bomber before the second attack and save real lives. Goodwin instructs Stevens to acquire a handgun from the conductor's compartment before he's placed back in the source code. Stevens returns to the train, tired of repeating the same scenarios that get him nowhere. Stevens asks if Christina would trust him if he did something dangerous, and she answers no. Disappointed, Stevens heads to the conductor's compartment and breaks the door open. Inside, he breaks the security box but is attacked and tased by the train conductors. Stevens wakes up, cuffed to the stair rails, while Christina interrogates him about what happened. He asks to borrow Christina's phone to call his dad and apologize, but she refuses. Time runs out, and the train explodes. Back in the capsule, he asks Goodwin to speak to his dad, and she promises that he will later. Stevens catches a glimpse of Goodwin's jacket as she explains the source code's narrow requirements. Goodwin stresses they must focus on finishing the mission, encouraging him to find the bomber again before sending him back to the train. On the train, Stevens draws the CAOCN logo that he saw on Goodwin's jacket. He asks Christina to help him discover what happened to the real Coulter Stevens before approaching a group of passengers. When he sees one of them nervous, he takes the guy's bag and searches it but finds nothing. Walking away, he spots a woman with a Walter Reed Army Medical Center bag, but his previous actions have the woman nervous around him. Stevens asks the woman about the logo, and she identifies it as the Nellis Air Force Base. Stevens borrows the woman's phone and finds the contact number for the airbase. While waiting to be transferred to Dr. Rutledge, Christina finds him and reveals that Captain Coulter Stevens was killed in action two months ago. The news breaks Stevens' connection to the source code. Suddenly, his vision blurs, and he hears Goodwin's voice echoing in his mind. Stevens collapses, seeing visions of his last memories in Afghanistan before waking up back in the capsule. Point blank, Stevens asks Goodwin if he's dead. Goodwin diverts his attention back to the mission, but he continues to demand an answer. With no choice, Goodwin confesses that his body is broken beyond repair, but his brain is still active. What he sees in the capsule, including his body, is just a manifestation from his mind. The revelation deforms the capsule before him as he goes into shock. Angry and in disbelief, Stevens demands more information, forcing Dr. Rutledge to talk to him directly. He warns him from deviating from his mission and advises Stevens to see the mission as a way to serve the country after death. Stevens, however, disagrees. Dr. Rutledge tells him to keep the millions of lives he could save in the real world in mind while he's back on the mission. With Dr. Rutledge in command, Stevens is placed in the source code repeatedly without rest. Given that hundreds of passengers are on the train, Stevens struggles to identify the bomber after several attempts. Dr. Rutledge plays Stevens' father's speech during his memorial to remind him that he's a hero, even to his father. This gives Stevens conviction. Back on the train, Stevens successfully steals the gun from the conductor's compartment then checks the phone detonator on the bomb. He unplugs the phone and calls the only number in its call history. With the person on the other end not speaking, Stevens threatens the man as he heads out the bathroom. He finds the man with the college student on the phone, believing that he's the bomber. Putting the gun on his side, Stevens confiscates his phone to prevent him from detonating the bomb. The man introduces himself as George, a software engineer who's just talking to his wife on the phone. To confirm, Stevens redials the number from the bomb's phone but hears the ringing somewhere else. Outside, the man who left his wallet while exiting the train takes his ringing phone out. Stevens follows the man, who hops back on the train to leave his wallet inside before leaving. Stevens picks up the wallet, identifying the man as Derek Frost. The doors close, disabling him from following Derek. Stevens pulls the emergency door release and jumps out of the moving train. The momentum has him rolling on the ground violently, hitting his head on the pavement. Christina notices him from the train's window and yells to stop the train. Stevens fights through the pain and spots Derek getting into a white van in the parking lot. Stevens confronts Derek, figuring that he deliberately left the wallet to make people think he's dead. Derek smiles, impressed by what Stevens knows. Inside the van, Derek reveals several bombs wired to a metal box decorated like the American flag. As Stevens interrogates Derek, Christina approaches, distracting him. This allows Derek to shoot them both. While he's on the ground, Derek checks his wallet and sees Sean's ID. Derek claims that the world is hell and can only be rebuilt from its ashes. He leaves the couple to bleed out in the parking lot as he makes his way to his second target. A second phone detonates the bomb from the train, causing the explosion. 
Stevens wakes up in the capsule where he identifies Derek Frost as the bomber and shares his van's plate number. With the mission finally successful, Stevens requests to go back to the source code to have a chance to save the passengers on the train, even if it won't be real. Outside, the police arrest Derek before the second attack. The source code success allows Dr. Rutledge to market his invention to prevent future crimes. Stevens, however, isn't happy, knowing that Dr. Rutledge won't allow his request. While alone, Stevens asks Goodwin if she wonders about an alternate version of herself who made different choices. She reminds him that his experiences in the source code aren't real, but he still saved lives in the real world. Despite this, Stevens is bothered by the bomb detonating in the train in his last run. Goodwin stresses that Christina and the others are dead, but Stevens is adamant about getting a second chance to save them. On Goodwin's side, she reads his messages from the computer. She doesn't hear his voice or see his reactions at all. She looks around, lingering her eyes on a chamber in another room and to Dr. Rutledge. Finally, she leaves her seat to activate the source code, promising to terminate his life support after the last run. Stephen smiles. They share their farewells before Goodwin sends him back on the train. Stevens converses with Christina happily, asking her to go out with him instead of going to work. Christina confesses to hoping that he'd ask her for coffee and agrees. Before their date, Stevens goes back to the bomb and disables the first detonator. He carefully turns the bomb, locating the second detonator and unplugging it. With both phones in his pocket, he steals a pair of handcuffs from a conductor. Back in the base, Goodwin finds Dr. Rutledge closing a deal to fund more source codes. After his phone call, Goodwin reminds him of their deal with Stevens to let him die. But Dr. Rutledge refuses, not wanting to risk losing the only potential candidate who can use the source code. Instead, he wants to wipe Stevens' memory so they can use him again. On the train, Stevens captures Derek and holds him at gunpoint, forcing him to stay on the train after leaving Glenbrook Station. Stevens uses Derek's phone to call the police and report his crime. After leaving Derek handcuffed, Stevens sends Goodwin an email. Then, he calls his father but pretends to be Sean, who served with his son. Tearfully, Stevens apologizes to his father over their last argument. Meanwhile, Goodwin opens the chamber where Stevens' real body is attached to life support. She sees his peaceful face while his lips move, mimicking the conversation he's having on the source code. Dr. Rutledge discovers Goodwin and rushes to stop her. Back on the train, Stevens shares peaceful thoughts for the distressed passengers. To lighten up the mood, Stevens pays Max to do a stand-up comedy act on the train. Stevens and Christina watch the performance, relishing the life and laughter surrounding them. With 25 seconds left, Stevens kisses Christina just as Goodwin turns off his life support. The scene in the train freezes as Stevens' heart fails. His body dies with a peaceful smile on his face. But on the train, a day continues. Stevens checks his watch, surprised that he's still there after 8 minutes. With a second chance in life in the source code, Stevens walks with Christina to Milan Young Park, where they approach the Cloud Gate sculpture, the same one Stevens sees in his visions. In the reflection, Stevens is still in Sean's body. He accepts his new role and new life, finding peace in this alternate reality. In the Nellis Air Force Base, the alternate reality Goodwin arrives at her desk and receives Stevens' email. Here, she learns of Derek's failed bombing before even hearing about it from Dr. Rutledge. Goodwin checks on Stevens' body in the chamber, finding hope that the source code can create alternate realities where she and Stevens save the world. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.